everyone. It's always exciting to dive into conversations about impactful work. Today, we are chatting with Ina Khalil Lim, a trailblazer in social entrepreneurship who leads the Children's Industry Lifelong Learning Development Hub, or CHILD, and The Good Shop. Ina's work at CHILD involves utilizing local culture and community support to make children's education more effective and inclusive. And through The Good Shop, she's empowering social entrepreneurs across Malaysia. We'll dive into these ventures alongside her advocacy for gender equality and empowering women and girls. Let's hear how she's making an impact. Welcome, Ina. Thank you for having me here, Dadin Sri. Ina, before we dive into Child and the Good Shop, can you share a bit about yourself? Oh, a little bit about myself. Okay. <laughs> um, born and bred in KL, but I, my parents are from the East Coast, so they always, uh, people can always spot me when I speak Malay because I don't actually speak with a KL accent. My Malay has a little uh, oh, East Coast I didn't Coast even know twang. they had that too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's a, a slight difference, yeah. right? <laughs> So basically, I grew up in KL and always being surrounded by, uh, you know, diverse communities. You know, I went to a government school at that time. There were only government schools, and it was really nice to have friends from, you know, all across the board. You know, you've got um, all races, all religions. You know, all uh, from all groups. You know, and every we were all just there learning together. So I went to a convent school. So I think. A lot of my experience uh, at the convent school being all girls, where you're all girls, there's no gender inequality issue. No. Everybody yes. has to achieve. So I think the teachers really, you know, pushed us to think that way and build our confidence that way. So in my family also, four, we have four siblings and we're all girls as well. So, oh, wow. So I okay. think this again helped, you know, made, made me in a sense blind to gender issues because yeah, okay. it was always you know parents expected us to have and achieve certain grades teachers expected us to achieve and do certain things so it was really only when I started going to um, do you know upper secondary uh, matriculation you know A levels and then I started learning about this gender inequality glass ceiling these mm. issues and my roommate her focus was actually she's uh, very much about inequality she actually grew up in Armenia where they have conflict oh. it's an area that has this legacy and still some conflict with their yeah. neighbors and all and she actually uh, before we became roommates she in her secondary school was actually working for bodies that were working for um, peace resolution hmm. So when we were roommates and I, you know, we would talk about, okay, what are you studying? What am I studying and mm. whatnot? And she would say, oh, you know, I'm going to do this uh, women's studies and some gender inequality and glass ceiling. And that was all new to me. And I, and I said, because I never experienced it. Right. I said, what do you mean? Why, why is there such a thing? And I think it was really her sharing of how she had experienced it and mm. how there are studies and, you know, lots, such such a huge body of research, how these issues still prevail. I think that was sort of what set Sparked me in off. you, right? <laughs> yeah. What you're doing yeah. today, you will probably also attribute it to, you know, maybe the discussions that you have had yes. with her, right? Yes. Because that must have sparked it as well. Let's come to your work because, mm -hmm. you know, one side is the child and then you have the and social entrepreneurs that both are I'm quite interested in because I very much talk talk about the social entrepreneurship and I think I keep telling that's the way forward yeah. because we are giving back to the community and at the same time it's a meaningful way to yes. even do business that's today right. you know right. and so as someone leading these two impactful social enterprises what do you believe is the most essential quality for driving social change it's a very interesting question because the answer perhaps is too simple. It has to involve the whole community. Mm. Everybody must believe in it. Everybody must invest in it. You know, so we cannot uh, just talk to the converted 
You have to talk to the people who disagree with you. Mm. You have to talk to the people who do not believe uh, in your causes. And I think one of the things with uh, social entrepreneurism or impact work or benefit work, call it what you may, but it is actually about prioritizing what the community needs at that time. Mm which evolves. Yeah. And so I think the you will see these waves of different social entrepreneurs and different trends uh, go up when there is a need. Mm. For example, during the pandemic, all the food aid and yeah. health, you know, everyone went up. Um, so, of course, in conventional enterprises, yeah. everybody who was supplying sanitizers and all that, they grew. Yes. But now the needs are different. Yeah. And so... Everybody just has to be involved. I, I hope, you know, it's, it's, it's a simplistic think, yeah, answer, it's, but complicated it's, to yeah, implement. It's, it's, it is difficult in the sense that um, I am asking you, it's, you know, it's easy <laughs> to ask the question. It kind of, it probably might need half a day to talk about yeah. it. It's simply put, you need the will of the nation, yes. you know, because everybody should be on the same page. That's right. And also not just agreeing, but they should be convinced and they should believe in it because that's, that's right. when things will change. Um, we realized when when we kind of ventured into something new mm -hmm. and we realized that there's so much of research has been done. There's so much of paperwork that's in place. I mean, yes. that's there. Yes. Okay. We, and everybody knows what the gaps are that's right. and, and what needs to be done the question is, how are we going to do it? Yes. You know, and the question is, can we get everyone um, to benefit and, and can we raise everyone? So how impactful that social change can be, mm -hmm. it's actually the, it's huge, you Absolutely. know, the Absolutely. magnanimity of wanting the change and implementing the change, it's humongous. Absolutely. You know, so... I think people like you and us, and there's many people who are uh, change makers. Mm -hmm. I think the, the thing is, I think to start somewhere, exactly, right, and exactly. kind of start nudging our way. And I think the big thing will uh, believing that it will happen at some point. That's right. I think that part of uh, hope, you know, never ending hope, yeah, has to be there. It's never ending hope. It could be stubbornness. It could be delusional. People might say many things. You yeah. know, people will say, why do you keep harping on this project? Yeah. Oh, this, this topic. Why do you keep harping on you know, gender equity, mm. gender equality? Mm. Hasn't it been solved? No, it hasn't been oh, solved. <laughs> you know? So there's so many topics. I think when it comes to society, it's really just, again, each culture, each society has their own challenges. Yeah. And no one issue is... For me, my personal opinion is that there's no one issue that is greater than the other because it really is locality specific, yeah. community specific. So we cannot say, for example, the case of, let's say, access to clean water. Mm. We will say, okay, Malaysia, we are blessed with tropical water. Mm. We've got lots of rain. We shouldn't have this issue. But we do in some of our interior communities yeah. with Orang Asli, yeah. we do yes, have this do have. issue. Yeah. So um, is it as important as, for example, protecting girls from child marriages. Is it more? It's like a you know, mother cannot love, uh, or you know, you're not supposed to love one child more but than the yes, other, right? I, so I, if I, you I ask me, which one is more important? It's really hard to answer. Yeah, I know. And, you know. I know what you mean because sometimes when we are also looking at projects, we want to focus. We don't want to too many pillars. We don't want to do too many things because you stretch your hands out. That's right. Then the potential of making an impact gets, you know, you're not able to do that because you're all over the place, right? That's right. I would like to more ask what, what inspired you to establish child, child. Okay? okay? Because I know it also says you focus on education. Yes. So I'm just going to throw this question and say, is education, I mean, we all know what education means, like in the sense mm -hmm. of, you know, it's academics, right? Uh, today, that's what people just talk about. Is that alone going to be enough for the future? I think for us, education actually is not only academics. Okay. Because there are many, many things that, you know, the academic curriculum 
formal curriculum that that is uh, has been established with you know lots of scholars putting in a lot of input developing it mm. that's important yes but when we look at education we have to look at it holistically because we do not uh, we there is absolutely no hope that 100% of the children will no. s- achieve the academic results that you know everybody everybody becomes doctors or lawyers or engineers so what other types of education can we nurture and value really truly value so that these children who receive that education is something that they enjoy that they they love and they can convert it into a livelihood yeah. that is uh, dignified yes um and provides them the necessary uh income that can support their families going forward in the future. So education, we would say, is not just the academic side, okay. but for child, the foundation of how the different children experience and seek for knowledge has the same basis because it's based on simply literacy. Hmm. You whether, whether it's literacy, you know, using books or getting familiar with knowledge through other media. Hmm. It it what media and what tools you use doesn't matter, but throughout humankind as we evolve when we started learning about you know developing conceptual ideas psychologically, what are the tools that we have used to evolve as uh, humanity and how we communicate from, you know, being illiterate to using papyrus and writing these codes that have become languages. Yes. And so this is what, when, when we say literacy, this is the basis all people will learn probably through this. If you are in a community that does not use books, there will be other ways mm. to, to learn mm. education. But again, it, it doesn't fall far from essentially what is storytelling. Yeah. Storytelling about the content, whatever yeah. it might be. So Make, making mm. I think making education also very um, interactive, Absolutely. isn't it? Yeah, yes. because that's what storytelling that's is what about, storytelling right? Is, yes, and I think um, I because we are talking in the Malaysian context, um, I've heard many times that the students don't have the confidence to get up and ask questions, even if they don't understand. They will just sit quietly and probably will go and ask the other students sitting next to them or go to the teacher after exactly. class. And, you know, but don't have the confidence to ask questions. Don't have, they don't stand up and say anything, you exactly. know. So I think it's probably very Asian because we don't see that in the Western countries, but it's a lot prevalent in the Asian countries. You definitely, know. definitely. So that's where culture comes in yeah. and even the education True. of culture and what we understand about culture, what is acceptable. Yeah. First, one of the things that uh, I mean, I'm um, seeing even in my own daughter, she's uh, eight now and she's in school and uh, this fear of, you know, initially it was fear yeah, of answering answering the question. Yeah, Second is, if I answer the question wrongly, yes. what does that mean? You yes. know? So we really should not discourage our children by yeah. saying, you know, you really have to score 100%, A, 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 yes, great if you do, but if you don't, oh, that means you are, you know, you're not putting in the hours, you're not putting in the time, you're not putting in the, in the effort. No, you should not uh, put these messages to the child yeah. because perhaps that child is a beautiful, will grow up to be a beautiful classical dancer or a painter who does not really need to answer the questions that yeah. that they might have been presented. With child, the approach that we do really is to encourage loving to read, right. loving to learn. It's yeah. not about, can I read the right. words? Can I yeah. read the alphabets? Yes. It's about loving reading to yeah. seek knowledge. Yeah. And whatever the knowledge is, whether it's uh, in the fine arts or it's in the medical sciences yeah. or accounting, anything, anything, you, you know, go and look for it. Love it. If you love it, go for it. Yeah. So you just kind of, it starts from young, isn't it? Starts it starts from yeah, young. Because whether even it's a book, I mean, even if it's a, just a reading science fiction or whatever it yes. might be, I mean, you have to start them young. You, you know, have to reading start them, yeah. because that, that that's a very good habit. So, because why I asked you that question is because 
um, nowadays parents so much focus and pressure on the children is to excel academically, yes. but socially, yes. or you know, to or to have the values and and also communication skills. Because uh, thanks to social media mm-hmm. and to our phones, I have seen teenagers in a restaurant. They go out. I mm-hmm. mean, you know, trying to have a meal, but. Everybody is on their That's own right. phones That's and they're right. not talking to each other. Absolutely. Families do that all the time. Yeah, families do that all the time. So, you know, talking about AI and technology today, I, it has its good and bad. I, I think technology, it's, it's all about how we use the tool. Yeah. It is a tool. AI, uh, amazing, amazing um, developments, is. you know, yeah. that have come up. But it's really, AI is something that an older maybe teenager, mm. should be exposed to. Mm. Not for a five-year-old mm. to be exposed to. Mm. So um, just a little bit about, i just uh, touch a little bit about some of the neuroscience uh, behind this, the cognitive learning. Um, there's been you know, some really interesting imaging work just to see how the brain is processing these different media. Because we would say oh. knowledge, knowledge in the past probably 100, 200 years when you know, books became very common, has been, it literally is a book, a piece of paper with some print on it. Yes. And parents may be sitting with their children reading the books in the evening because the child may be starting with just a picture book. Here's a book, a picture of uh, cutlery, for example, fork, spoon, a picture of a cat. And then there will be um, uh, books, books, uh, Picture story books yeah. where there is a story, but with pictures that complement. Right. Right? So Malaysia also has uh, Malay, Malay language books with some mm. of these. Um, of course, in English, there's plenty of books. but um, And then there'll be the illustrated books where there's more text, less pictures. And then we graduate to you know, novels with just words. Now, what we are doing in the last, you know, since the prevalence of the uh, tablets... Everything is so easy and parents are really using it as almost like a, a pacifier yeah. for yeah. all children. Yeah. Yes, you true. know, whether it's just, you know, okay, uh, just calm down, uh, wait for the food, wait for dinner to come, was, you know, you know, yeah. wait for, you know. I, I've uh, seen that you know, in so the it, restaurants, it's yeah. All the time. And when they do these imaging studies, they definitely see there is a difference in the areas that are lighting up in the brain. So where is the oxygen going to? Mm. how much oxygen is going to your brain to process. So there's more oxygen, there's more processing, there's more thinking and building of knowledge happening. But when you get your quote-unquote knowledge through a device, it's one way. There's no social interaction. Um, It's Mm. not even something that you might be seeking because the algorithm might be just, you know, sending you next suggestion, suggested video, you know, it's the next suggested video. You're not even thinking what you are reading. So we, I think the... Uh, cognitive science does not really have an answer yet how this will impact us, but we do know there are differences that is happening at a biological level. Wow. So okay. Isn't that scary? It though? is, it is quite it? scary. Uh, I mean, so, I know. Which also means... <laughs> We might be ha- we might be having more younger people probably having dementia and memory loss. Yes, yes it's, because it's a possibility. You don't have, actually, yeah, it's a yeah. possibility because if the oxygen is not going to the brain, because if you just take the simple way of when we were in in yes. university, like what is your reference? You have to go to the uni- you have to go to the library. You yes. have to pull out all the books that's yes. relevant to what you're doing and you start going through and marking and and all these books are open and you know yes. the pages that you need kids today i mean my nieces today you know they're like everything is in that com- laptop and exactly. the computer they just open it open it open it up and you know then yeah. all the reference it's all sitting in front of you yes. so i don't know if they are any more thinking the way we did it's you definitely know. different. I it's it's hard to say whether it's more or less. Definitely, I mean, you're always using your brain. It is engaged. You but are. At what level you are engaging, yeah, and what parts of the brain are you engaging? How much of yes. we are thinking? One right? of so, the beautiful things about reading is, especially when it's text, uh, you act and when you are guiding it yourself, you either as a parent or you as a young child guiding, you are making the decision to image processing and visualize. So if I say, oh, there's a cat, so you. Use your imagination to visualize. Is it? Is it? Could be a white cat, black cat, uh, 
fluffy cat, a Siamese cat, how big, yeah. you know, where is yeah. it? But when you present that image as a video on screen, you yeah. don't you know, even have to make that effort. You know, it's there. <laughs> it's a cat. All right, I see it. Yeah. But I mean, we do. I do <laughs> that sometimes. When somebody says about an animal and I've never come across, you're quickly going and, you know, you, yeah. you just Google, tum. You know, yeah, it's not like right. you have to go and, you know, uh, look at any other books or anything that's like that. Right. You don't. You just put the name. What is the name of that animal? Or oh, what is, okay, you just put it exactly. and it just comes out. So, mm. yeah, so I don't know if it is a good, or th- not a good thing. But anyway, but I wanted to also ask you, what is the Arau approach it says Arau. Arau, Arau approach. approach that yes. child uses to integrate local culture into its educational practices. And um, how do you even, uh, how do you do it? Can how you just... Do you do it? Okay. So the Arau approach was developed by Professor Dr. Bustam Kamri. He is the first uh, Malaysian um, doctorate holder in early childhood education. Mm. He's uh, been a full professor for a uh, long time and many, many, many a times he has been revising and working with the government curriculum to update the curricula. Um, to make sure it's of the quality standards that you need. Um, so he is definitely, you know, uh, very knowledgeable in this area. And one thing that is interesting, an observation that he made, is Malaysia ourselves, we do not have an approach that we use that suits us. We have the tendency to look outside mm. Mm. And whether it's a Japanese syllabus or a you know, German syllabus mm. or mm. you know American, whatever it may be, but we like to um, borrow these and adapt. We can call it adapt. Uh, definitely, we have some of these uh, other approaches from other countries. Yeah. Italy actually has developed two um, approaches, and I think you may have heard of them: uh, Emilia, uh, Reggio Emilia, and Montessori. Mm. So Montessori is Montessori pretty well, is known well known here. everywhere. Yes, they are from uh, both were developed in northern Italy. Right, and so um, Professor Bustam, uh, he's been in the field for a long time, and uh, you know, working with many other scholars developing this field, he and his colleagues, but no one's actually come to develop a Malaysian approach. So mm. Arau, the name Arau approach was chosen because, again, inspired by the two, two syllabus from uh, Silvai from Northern Italy. Arau is in the north of Malaysia, in Perles. <laughs> and also from the song uh, Malaysia Berjaya, you know, where it goes, uh, Dari Perles sampai lah ke Sabah, Mele- apa? Kita uh. sudah merdeka. Yeah? So this uh. is a uh, patriotic song from the right. 60s, 70s that were developed. I think everyone in school would know the song. Every merdeka, you would hear this song. And essentially, the spirit of the song is about Malaysia succeeding. Oh, And nice. from Perles to Sabah, to the world. So Arau is, uh, the name Arau approach is really, it's inspired by that because the hope is we develop our own yeah. approaches and tools that will work for us. And if there are other countries that can uh, in similarly use the tools uh, that we develop, uh, that would be great. Now, what is the Arau approach? It's based on three pillars. One is a child-to-child perspective. Mm. Um, the second is that it does involve the community. Of course. And the third is it's long-term. It's a hundred-year approach. Oh, wow. We are not going to expect anything in one year, two years, three years. We are looking definitely in the long term right. uh, for generations. So to build a generation and realizing that to build something good, it takes time. So the example of the child-to-child approach is, for example, if you have a child who is learning how to eat nasi lemak with their hands, and then uh, this child has a younger sibling who is just learning, mm. can they use their child methods of uh, communication, gesturing right. to yeah. communicate to another child? a sibling or a cousin. Okay, yeah. this is how you use your hands. Do you take the sambal or that's too spicy? Don't put the sambal. You know, what is the communication that you, they are using? Um, bring it to older children. How do you use fine motor skills to grip a pencil hmm. for coloring, right. for example? Right. Things yeah. like that. So it's very child-to-child perspective. Now, when it, now the name child, children's industry, yeah. we deliberately 
put the word industry there because when we say children's industry and education, so people automatically will think, oh, it just means kindergarten teachers or school teachers. Mm. Um, and we are saying the child industry is huge. From the moment a child is born, who is the first interface in terms of industry? It would mm. be the pediatric medical team. Mm. Along with the pediatric medical team, there are the... Uh, clothes producers, mm. baby clothes. Mm. You've got furniture producers who are making baby cribs. Mm. You've got the automotive industry who is interfacing with car seats or baby, you know, baby yeah. carrier yeah. systems. Uh, there's the nutritional industry yeah. who will give uh, baby yeah. milk, so you're not, baby you're bottles. Looking at everything, it every is aspect. everything that's interfacing with the child, and mm. all these, whether. All these industries are ready set up with the appropriate experts who can correctly advise that these items really are beneficial for children or not need to be there. So mm. the child practitioners need to be there. So we come back, I'll just give the example of these screens, for example. We've got toy companies who have developed apps that are designed, quote unquote, for children. Mm. And these children for, you know, since probably 2017, 2018, 2019, the digital natives have been exposed to these items. But now we are looking, you know, six, seven, eight years later, the children seem to be very jittery, very unable to control their emotions because mm. they're not interacting with people. So oh, now wow, you've yeah. got governments in France, in Australia, who are contemplating legislation to control these the use of these devices mm. in schools or in journals. So there are lots of... So these devices and apps in itself, it's not evil. It's a great innovation, but it's yeah. just how the tools are used. Yeah. So do so. are the practitioners, the childhood practitioners in all the industries, industries, do they know when is it appropriate and when is it not appropriate mm. to use these tools? For example, in the medical field, there are definitely lots of um, medication, pharmaceuticals, uh, offerings that are natural, more natural, and some are more uh, chemical-based. Mm. So if you were a doctor prescribing a child, you would assess, okay, how is this child doing? Is it a case where the, the more gentle homeopathic options might be good enough? Right. Or is it a case that is serious that, too serious that really you have to go you know, with the, the big guns, the it might be pumping the child with chemicals, but perhaps that's what the child needs because mm. of their medical condition at that time. So the medical practitioner must make these judgments and assessments. So anyone as a child practitioner in the children's industry has to weigh these considerations. You know, I'm not saying that there has to be a warning sign every time there's a yeah, cartoon. But yeah. There's a warning sign, okay, make sure you only watch these cartoons course, in certain conditions. Yeah. Um, but... You have to be mindful. And I think this is where parents and the community really need a lot of help. And that's where a child is coming in because we really, we want to empower families because the families know how, they love their children. Uh, they know them best. They are the first line of, you know, uh, love and protection and nurturing that these children face. But sometimes there's so much... Uh, options out there that it gets confusing. I know well, because because we have the school for children with special needs, and yes. I and and I do understand. And like you said, when do we when these apps are out? Because the question is also when do you actually give those notebooks and you yes. know the phones to the children at what age? At because that age, when yes. I was in Europe, and I have seen when parents uh, this one I actually saw that the mother brought this uh, one of these games you know yes. those uh, board games mm -hmm. and although it was all adults and this one child but the mother was sitting with the child and was actually playing the board game exactly. you know didn't That's need a lot wonderful, right wonderful, yes. i mean it's but she's also talking to others but at the same time she knows it's a very simple it's board very game simple. It's, and i think yeah. so I think this again comes back to the parents, isn't it? I mean, to to greater extent, to me, mm -hmm. the responsibility is is on them as when the children are young, because they can't make decisions. They will not know what to do, and um, 
obviously your i mean our approaches now i can understand from all this <laughs> that you are saying yes it's a long term it is long uh, term uh, you know let's call it 100 let's not call it 100 years and and <laughs> bother 50, everyone 50 years to 100 years yeah. <laughs> let's just 50 years. let's just tell them that but i think we need to, we need to make the small steps yes. um but quickly because i think we're also running out of time but just quickly i wanted to touch on your the good shop yes. because i am an advocate and very much uh, even Uh, QI as an organization yes. um i tell them that you know when we are sourcing for merchandise we are looking for mm-hmm, things mm-hmm. and products we have to look at social enterprise yes. because that's our way forward thank you so much so for your support can you for get this. us can yes. you tell us a little bit about what what do you do in the good shop and uh, maybe a little bit of what your vision is like so the good shop is uh the basis of the good shop um and we have to go back to 2013 At that time, there was not actually this terminology is not actually very well known mm. or much heard mm. of. So, uh, how what inspired it was actually me visiting a friend in uh, Kuching because we, I've got relatives there, so we were visiting friend and this friend um, uh, had set up a social enterprise and even I myself asked her, "What do you mean social enterprise?" Yeah. So she brought me to her workshop. And um, she showed me what was her vision, which was to empower young women in uh, Songket craftsmanship so that they can take that as a, a livelihood. Because Songket is a wonderful, a beautiful Malaysian craft, yeah. a traditional craft, very expensive. Yeah. Um, so if you are a craftsman, you're a master craftsman or craftswoman, you can you know, get a, a decent livelihood, a good livelihood, you know. So... When I came back to the Klang Valley, I started looking out for these sorts of products. But so there were a few through the, through her uh, network and friends and connections. Is okay? Who are the other places that have uh, social enterprise products or services? And they were scattered. And yeah. if I, I, it would be very difficult for anyone to find them because you have to go to some taman here, there, everywhere. And I think at that time, not everybody was well listed with the uh, Google, you know, SEOs and whatnot. So. The idea for the good shop was really to be the social enterprise enabling platform, make it mainstream. So we, the idea was to curate these brands, hmm. services, bring them to the mainstream, and we were very blessed to have a uh, Sunway group take a bet on us and making us uh, have a showcase with them for three months, really showcasing with activities and products and services. And I think those at the beginning, everybody was. Who came? They were confused. Are you a charity? I say no. It's an enterprise, but it's a social enterprise. I said, what does that mean? And so there was a lot of these questions uh, that came about. So, um, but since and since then, I would definitely say there's more brands. More brands have come up, but you know, of course, some brands have you know gone away. You know, they have you know, uh, it's a business. The I think the thing about social enterprise, the word enterprise is there. Yeah. It is meant to run as a sustainable business. Yes. With uh, serving the market to what the market needs, yes. So that is the one that should be driving mm. the social, social enterprise. So, how it's uh, done, whether it's through a product or providing a service um, or activities, uh, that depends on which community mm. is being served. So, the good shop is really we f- we see it as it's a network. Yeah. And uh, what our last outing uh, was in 2019 December. Just before oh. the pandemic, so it was really, in a way, you know, that was our the last outing that we had, and then we were planning for 2020, and then when the pandemic hit and everything, you know, was was closed, it really, you know, got me and my team thinking: Is it just about retail? So, you know, so mm. is it about retail? Because at that point, there were other more immediate needs, mm. and so. Um, coming to now 2023, 2024, oh. how is the social enterprise space then in 2013, 2014, 2015 was different from now? Mm. I would we have achieved our mission to make this idea of social enterprise more well known. Mm. Is it accepted in the mainstream? I would say the fact that Bursa Malaysia has an ESG reporting. Yeah. Uh, guidelines yeah. now. It's more visibility. It is a lot of visible, so it's yeah. pushing now from the top. Previously, yeah. we were working from the grassroots. That's true. Now it's actually coming from the top. We it's still quite new, 2023, just last year. Yeah. So it's very good now to see in the next 10 years 
how the corporates start in making social enterprise the norm yeah as opposed to you know something a quirk it's on the <laughs> side yeah. it also important for these uh, owners of the social enterprise also i think they would need a lot of capacity building isn't it yes. yeah because yes. i think it's like you said enterprise end of the day is a business yes. and it needs to make money that's right because otherwise they kind of close down and exactly. and go out of it very fast you that's know right. so i i mean i'm very much i advocate not only do i advocate i look for small businesses mm-hmm. who are doing and a lot have flourished if you would say like even after the pandemic yes. you know small businesses per se who are doing uh, products with recycled things That's and right. even uh, cosmetic and stuff like that so i look for these enter- enterprises or entrepreneurs and and then i say they are the ones i want to buy it from because um, it's my way of supporting and giving exactly. back i think with this corporations and everyone thinking i think the mindset of the community needs to change exactly. as well so i think overall um i think it's whether it, we are talking about children the arau approach of looking at our local culture right mm-hmm. because we work with indigenous community right we are mm, working yes. with orang asli so one of the things we are looking at is coming up with educating them where it is um you know bringing their culture into mm-hmm. the curricula you know yes. the the way to approach them is how would they study it's exactly. not what we do we kind of put it on them instead of that it's how will they approach education exactly. you know so that's why this when you said the approach and i looked at it and it said that integrate local culture i was very much interested that's why i asked about it yeah. from you can i elaborate a little bit more also about yeah, that yeah, the local can, culture yeah. this When we talk about local culture we also do mean the immediate surroundings of the child and the family. So if we were talking about a child in PJ, Petaling mm. Jaya is a metropolitan mm, metropolitan yeah. area, you can reference things that are readily available in the city. Um the for example the trains the LRTs you know you can reference shopping malls yeah. you can reference these things yes. but you probably wouldn't be able to reference a paddy field of course so yes or you wouldn't be able to reference you know um tap rubber tapping things yeah. like that yeah. so when it comes so now there's a lot of talk in education about science yeah. so how do we incorporate science mm. into the learning whether it's a child in the city a child uh, orang asli child and in the interior or a child in perles who are surrounded by paddy fields yeah. um how do you teach science are we really expecting the same books and the same references to be used for them to understand I don't think that's fair on the child is beyond the knowledge of the child to know you know for a child in the city to know about paddy fields yeah. whereas the child in the paddy field will know exactly okay the 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 field the soil the you know when do you harvest when do you not harvest what's yeah. good and bad for for the growth of the plants yeah. but would not really have any clue about how to use the LRT system nah. and tokens yeah. and what not right true it's different but so if when you're trying to teach science what is what are the tools and references you can use mm. for those communities so yeah. for for the the physics for example physics uh, and engineering lrt yes for the child in the city yes you can use yeah. these topics but maybe for the child in perles there might be other things that you will have to reference so mm. um you know forces what forces there's lots of uh, there's a angin timur pesta angin timur there's wind you can learn yeah, about yeah. movement and all yes, that so this yes. is a, it can feed into you know wind and kites and flying and then maybe then you can start talking about jet engines and you know th- the things that take flight and how human engineering can you know True. but this is all based on the surroundings I their know. environment i mean i wish yeah, everybody would think like that today because <laughs> i think the curriculums are just thrown and you know books are just thrown at the teachers and say yeah i think and it's it's tough okay. for, it's tough for the teachers as well yes, because they yes. you know they have to meet the syllabus need they yeah, have I know, to i know uh, that's why know. everything is driven by grades and you mm. know uh, just pure academics and i think that needs to change i mm. think you know yeah. because meaning not change but more more like bring a balance i think 
progress, how to evolve it. Because yeah. you you still need the children to learn their times tables, even oh, though yeah. everybody yeah. hates it yeah. and whatnot, yeah. you know. But yeah. you uh, need but how that. How do you make it? How do you make it more interactive? Like, interactive, I think, yeah. yeah. And and they, uh, I think it's more engaging, more interactive, and more communicative. I I think that's yeah. what I would say. And a, uh, that's communication is one of the key principles means, for our approach. Means. Absolutely, yeah. You must have. You must love to. Okay, the the idea is you love to read. You seek knowledge. When you seek knowledge, you have to communicate with people, yeah. and you Very you important. will build your self confidence because it's something that you love. So of course yeah. you'll build more fluency and you know expertise in that True. field, and you will become the expert in that field, yeah. whatever it might be. But to have that uh, curiosity in the child, yeah. uh, you know, you you nurture it so it flourishes, as yeah. opposed to saying, "Oh, you haven't memorized your times table. Yeah. Sorry, you." I you think know, you create, cannot, you're not doing well in school. You create the environment <laughs> yes. for curiosity. Yes, I think that's exactly. that's what that's what it means. And uh, I think my 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 team is looking at me now and looking at both of us. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really nice talking to you, Thank and you I so think much for um, me. both these areas of your work is very much passionate for me because for us also we focus on education yeah. and and also and I talk about holistic approach uh, mm -hmm. to education and then just focusing on academics. I'm not against academics because you need you, you, you need, need that. Yes, I mean yes. to be going out there and surviving in this modern society today. Everyone needs education. I mean you know that's a fundamental thing. But I think. It has to be approached in a holistic way so that, you know, we will have youth and who are going out there into the workforce are balanced because I think that is what creating today a lot of people who are having um, issues with mental well-being yes. and uh, depression and sometimes easily giving up or... Uh, jumping from job to job per se because mm -hmm. of the dissatisfaction, yes. you know. Uh, because I think what they just think is it's all about the material things that they want to achieve, but they never think for themselves. I mean, what it is for me, you know, like, yes. do I want to be a better human being? Do I want to be empathetic? Do I want to um, be kind to somebody else and show compassion to my community? Or do I yes. want to show gratitude? None of these words exist in the dictionary of today's generation yes, so I, yes you that, know that that's something we need to i think that's something we need to do so it's great actually what you're doing is that integrating local culture and community involvement can make a difference whether we are tailoring initiative to meet specific needs ensuring inclusivity or supporting projects that empower communities every effort counts uh, Ina's work also reminds us that our collective passion for social change can lead to meaningful progress in education and many other areas. Um, thank you, Ina, for your time today. And uh, thank you so I, I much think it has for been. Letting us share. I think every time I sit here and I I talk to my guests, it actually gives me more ideas <laughs> and what we want to do. Everyone who's listening out there, if you have enjoyed today's episode, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Your feedback helps us continue bringing you inspiring guests and impactful stories. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.